Well, good day to you, Team Healthy. Uh, we have some serious chatting going on here. The, the hilarious thing is I try to get on a few minutes before the uh, the live feed starts here, and you all are, are uh, you're funny. Uh, if some of you who are watching this on tape, I don't know if you can go back and see all the chat that's gone before that uh, it actually goes on air, talking about what all these uh, 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 ab abbreviations are with the uh, LOL and all that stuff. What does that mean? We got we got a couple of folks that's like, I mean, you need some teenagers to interpret all that stuff for you. Okay, here we go. Um, hey, we have a really interesting broadcast here today or uh, live feed here today. And... Um, I'm going to be getting into, you know, how narcissists can be predictably unpredictable in the way that they engage. All right. Just a little fun thing. Uh, several of you, interestingly, have made the comment that we're about to push the uh, the 600,000 mark in our subscribers. Uh, I've got a ways to go to catch up with Dr. Romney. She's over a million. Uh, I mean, you hate to sound competitive, and I guess I am. Uh, she, she has wonderful stuff on there, so I don't begrudge that at all. So thank you for all your kind comments about all of that. And uh, we're going to see if we can uh, break break through the 600 here pretty soon. Um, also, just keep in mind that we do have our webinar that's coming up uh, July. I believe it's the 19th. It's a Tuesday on uh, dealing with the malignant narcissist. And so we have stuff about all of that on our uh, uh, survivingnarcissism.tv uh, website and all the other kind of stuff. Y'all y'all know y'all are familiar with all this. Okay, today uh, you know, we've had we've had a bunch of questions that seem to bunch together with respect to. Uh, just the, the same patterns from one person to the next to the next that imply narcissism. And so I'm asking the lead question here, do all narcissists read from the same playbook? And the answer is, eh, yeah, kind of, sort of. Uh, there, there's an old saying that I, I like to use, and, and I, I uh, did this story. I picked up on this. I don't know if I, if I came up with it or I heard it from someone else, to be honest. Uh, but the saying is, we're all alike and we're each unique, okay? We all have uh, some of the same core issues on the inside of our personalities. And it's interesting, we have a, an audience here literally across the globe, whether you're in Denmark or New Zealand or Japan or Tunisia or South Africa or uh, Norway or India, Human nature is human nature, and there are other elements that go into the making of who we are, sociological and family and, and all of that, but human nature is human nature, and we all have a, an inclination towards things like selfishness or wanting to be in control, or sometimes we can be unnecessarily defensive, or we can do the one-up kind of thing uh, within our engagements with other individuals. The difference between people on Team Healthy versus people that are just strongly narcissistic is people on Team Healthy see it. They acknowledge it. They recognize, okay, I have those capabilities. What are we going to do about it? And, and you take responsibility and you adjust and you move in a very uh, uh, progressive kind of way in the, in the way that you engage with other individuals. Narcissists have some of those core ingredients and it's like, I don't need to learn. <laughs> I need you to learn. I need you to go along with me. And, and they just keep going back to the same primitive, basic uh, tendencies that uh, hopefully those of us who are healthy outgrew in our childhood. And, and yet narcissists can be um, children in adult bodies. And so they have not grown properly. So, all of that said is a little lead in. I, I, I want to start with a comment, and this is from one of our uh, regulars. Uh, so I, I, I want to just uh, put this out there, just kind of set the tone. This person says, it's a strange thing. It's hard to explain or know if you're in an actual relationship with the narcissist. And you know that one of the things that I've said in uh, many of my videos is with with narcissists, you're not really in a relationship. You're in a you're in a transaction, and there's there's a huge difference in a relationship. You uh, the, the individuals want to know uh, each other's heart. They want to know each other's uh, motives and who they are and what their backstory is. Not for the purpose of gathering information and trying to be one up, but just simply for the purpose of knowing how to more effectively engage with people. 
So this person says it's hard to explain or know if you're in a relationship. Usually it's uh, uh, you're deep into it. And then she goes on to say, try to describe it to your closest friends. And they can be clueless, wondering if you're the crazy one. And by the way, I, I uh, have picked up on that kind of theme. And, um, and it's probably a couple of weeks out or so. I have another video coming up that, that's entitled, I was with a narcissist and no one believed me. And so that's coming up pretty soon. You know, there, sometimes you just, uh, you, you're only going to pick up on an individual's narcissism through your own experiences. Uh, but we can learn. So the, the first uh, real question we're going to zero in on today, this person asks, why do narcissists actually follow a pattern of abuse and where did they all learn the same tactics? You know, it's, it's really interesting that um, I, I know that many of you have had historical experiences where you've been on the receiving end of some form of abusive behavior. Now, some, it can be of the extreme variety, whether it's uh, extreme uh, verbal or physical abuse. Sometimes it might have been sexual abuse. Sometimes it can have been passive aggressive, neglect, things like that. And unfortunately, there are um, uh, influences in individuals' background that can be, that can fall into the category of abusiveness. And we know that most adult abusers were in fact abused in their earlier years. And you, the, the implication here yeah, uh, with this question, why do they follow this pattern of, of abuse? Um, some people learn from their issues and from their experiences, and some people don't. Uh, when you ask, you know, why do they follow this pattern of abuse? Th there can be a, a, a thinking, it's, and again, it's primitive thinking in the mind of a child that says, I hate this. I can't stand it when people are being condescending toward me. One of these days, I'm going to be the one who gets to be in that position. And, you know, it's, um, it, it's like, you know, you, uh, your parents get mad at you, so you hit your little brother as a means of compensation. Well, you'd like to think that as you age, you think, wait a minute, that's not, that's not good. Now, why in the world would I want to, uh, to do to someone else what was done to me? Someone in this equation needs to break that chain and it's going to be me. And that's what I want us on Team Healthy uh, to be. And you'll notice that's why I so strongly emphasize DRC, Dignity, Respect, and Civility. Those are such non-narcissistic traits. There's an interesting statistic that I want you to be aware of, and that is, uh, uh, this is going with the uh, the Myers-Briggs, and it uh, breaks down the introvert, extrovert, the sensory, intuitive. On that intuitive um, uh, uh, characteristic, that's the uh, the characteristic that uh, that indicates that a person likes to think things through in a very full and clear way. They like to ask the why questions. They like to go behind the scenes. You know what the percentage is of people who are intuitives uh, as a natural bent? Uh, okay, I'm going to give you just a couple of se um, uh, seconds here. Those of you who are watching live, you know what the percentage of intuitives are? It's it's just a little under 27%. So maybe one in four. It's actually like 26.7, something like that. About one in four people are intuitives. And basically, uh, one in four people are the kind of person that would say, you know, let's think this through. And so going to the question, if I've been through a pattern of abuse, let me try to figure out what abuse is all about and how that applies to me and how it's made me feel and how it's uh, caused me to, uh, to respond in the ways that I've done. And then see, let's even take it a, a little bit further. Not all intuitives are also emotive. That's the F, the feeling part. And so we bring that percentage down. Uh, when you have an, an intuitive who also learns how to, uh, to process their emotions well, and they're tuned into that emotional side, um, Narcissists, as a general rule, are not uh, the intuitive or the feeling kind of person. They're the kind of individuals who like to issue, issue edicts. And if they are intuitive, it tends to be of an intellectual variety, not of an, uh, an empathetic variety. 
And so uh, it, it, in order to make adjustments, in order to get away from that narcissistic pattern, you need both the intuitive understanding of what you're dealing with, and you also need to have an empathetic ingredient that, uh, that takes you into the, uh, the mind of how your actions are impacting other individuals. And those are ingredients that are just simply missing in the narcissist. So why do they follow the pattern of abuse? It's because uh, they've experienced it, but then they, they don't have that intuitive and empathetic uh, approach or uh, mindset that's going to take them beyond that. They just keep re repeating the cycle. And I, I sincerely hope that those of you who are watching can say, well, sign me up. I want to be one of the ones that breaks the chain. And that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Now, uh, this next uh, this next one, this is a little lengthy, but uh, hang in there with me. This person says, how do all these narcissists seemingly learn all the same ways of being so devious? It's like they've all gone to a school that I never attended or even heard of or missed out on. And the master classes are how to master the skills to manipulate people and pretzel them for your enjoyment. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a, uh, a, a creative way to put it. How do they come to these learned rules of behavior to rule over and use up people? Or uh, is it that they just never outgrew the normal self-absorbed selfishness of teenagers? Okay, right there at the very end. Uh, it's like, do they just go to the same school? Now, let's go back to my starting point. We're all alike, but we're each unique. All of us can have this kind of... Uh, inclination to have the selfishness. And uh, this person says, do they just never outgrow uh, the self-absorbed selfishness of teenagers? Ideally, in those teenage and those adolescent years, as you begin developing uh, abstract thinking, and that's that reasoning capability I'm talking about, then someone can sit down with you and guide you through your beliefs and your values and how it attaches to behaviors uh, I remember when I was a teenager and then especially when I was in college and then graduate school, I would I would eat it up when someone would sit down and say, let's talk about what's going on here. Let's talk about why you responded the way you did. And particularly if they did it in a respectful way with me, I, I, I would just think, OK, let's do it. Um, the uh, the potential for growth, I believe, can be on the inside of most people, but also the the history of uh, analytical thinking tends to be rather low. You know, whenever you have a, let's say an eight year old and then a 10 year old and a 15 year old who's uh, being disruptive, chances are instead of having analytical thinking, uh, they're going to hear something like knock it off or you're being ridiculous or why in the world would you be that way? And I'm saying it kindly, uh, it can come across in a very abrasive kind of way. And so narcissists tend to stay in this almost reptilian kind of way of, of thinking and reacting because they've not re uh, really been learned uh, or have not really learned to move out of that uh, just raw reactive kind of emotional style. And uh, they haven't really progressed beyond what we call pre-adolescent thinking. And so it, it's, it's important for you to realize this because whenever you're engaging with a narcissist and it doesn't go well, and you're left wondering what in the world happened here, the narcissist is going to say, well, I'll tell you what happened. What happened is you did something wrong and you, you're a, a defective person and they constantly want to put all the blame and shame onto you. It's what we refer to as victim shaming. You're the victim of their mistreatment, but they shame you for saying I'm hurting. And uh, all the while, uh, it's it's necessary for you to realize, no, wait a minute, this isn't about me when narcissists act this way. This is about their own inability to grow up. And, and sometimes these narcissists can be 70 years old. They still haven't grown up. Uh, but uh, let's let's recognize they, they didn't go to a school like this person says, where they learn how to manipulate people and pretzel them for enjoyment. Uh, but it, it makes you think that they did. What it is, is they didn't go to school for empathy and humility and, and uh, civility and conscientiousness and that, and they missed out on it. Or uh, it could have been that they were just so uh, deeply entrenched in it that whatever lessons came their way didn't take. And, and by the way, I have another video coming up. I think it's a Saturday. Uh, the question is, is narcissism a learned pattern? 
And the, the answer is sometimes you're hardwired to be that way. Other times there's a learning dimension that's there. It's a combination of multiple kinds of, uh, of elements there. So uh, all that to say, when they try to blame you for their inappropriate behavior, I'm hoping that what we're talking about here can be a, a strong reminder that says, no, there's something going on inside of them that they have not come to terms with. Um, this next person asked a question and see if you pick up on the, it's actually a double question inside of one. Uh, this person says, what's the most healthy way to manage conflict with someone to not trigger their narcissistic traits or to fall into your own dysfunctions. Then you pick up on the, uh, the double question. What's the best way to manage conflict with a narcissist to not trigger their narcissistic traits? That's one. And the answer is, uh, you can't get on the inside of that person's brain and say, I'm going to say something and I don't want you to be triggered. Uh, they are what they are. Uh, the, the, the second element of this question, what's the most healthy way to manage conflict with a narcissist and not fall into your own dysfunctions? Okay, that's a separate issue. When you're engaging with a narcissist and the conflict is there and then it doesn't play out very well, you have two different elements there. One is what's that narcissist going to do? And typically because of the nature of narcissism, they are going to be triggered. They are going to be agitated. They are going to respond poorly. They are going to blame it on you. That's just what they do. But then the next question is, how do you do that? And, uh, and knowing that they're going to be that way and then not fall into your own dysfunctions. Now that's a hard one. And, uh, I'm 68 years old and I've been, I, a lot of you knew that, I'm, I'm just an old codger by now. And I've, I've been working on that one literally my entire life. And I'll continue to work on that till the day I die. I don't ever uh, want to stop being a learner or so, I don't want to stop being someone that confronts myself. How do you not fall into your own dysfunctions when you're being triggered by that narcissist? And the short answer is you give yourself a definition of who you want to be. And then you take that definition. And then in your own mind, you try to rehearse how you're going to live inside your definition in your predictable moments of conflict. For example, let's suppose that you're married to someone who's highly argumentative. Okay. How can I uh, uh, deal with that person so that they won't get triggered? Well, if they're highly argumentative, you may just say hello the wrong way and they're already triggered. So the real question is, if you're married to someone or if you live with someone or it's an extended family member, you work with someone and they're highly triggered. OK, how do I define myself? And in the moment when that person is being triggered, do I have to go into a counter triggered mode in reverse? You know, you get angry, I get angry. You become argumentative, I become argumentative. You accuse, I counter accuse. Uh, is that what I do? And I dare say that many of you, and, and I've been in that same boat too, well, we, we can fall into that trap. But then over time, I'm hoping you can think, well, wait a minute. I can be working so hard on getting that other person to see the light that I wind up, I, I wind up going into their darkness. How do I want to be, even though I have this discomfort in front of me? How do I want to be, even though it's, this may be a solo act on my part? Is it possible for me to maintain my healthiness and my decency, knowing full well the other person in front of me is not going to join me? Now, if the answer is, I don't know, there is no answer to that, then you're screwed. But it is possible. And, and sometimes what it means is you have to learn how to live with a loose endedness. Uh, you may be thinking, all right, I'm going to do my best to be patient. I'm going to hold on to firmness, but I'm going to maintain decency in the midst of my firmness. I call that calm firmness. Uh, and then if the narcissist is not impressed or they keep coming back to their old uh, maladaptive uh, childish ways of engaging, it's like, I don't feel the need to convict them of something that I know is they're not going to receive. And that's hard. And so your, uh, your biggest challenge is knowing that narcissists do in fact seem to read from the same playbook and they seem to keep going back to the same old maladaptive behaviors over and over. 
your question is, well, do I go off into the same maladaptive behaviors too? Or am I that person that's able to learn so that when they give me an invitation, please join me over here in Crazyville. It's like, no, I've, been over, I've, been, I've taken that trip too many times. I don't want to join you there anymore. I have more important things to do. And it starts with me having a respect for myself. It, was, it starts with me having a, a well-conceived idea of who I want to be and how I want to conduct life. And it doesn't include that, which is why people like me will uh, will pull back and say, sometimes you have to have no contact or at the very least uh, what we refer to as gray rock. Uh, there's nothing more boring than a gray rock. And so when you take a gray rock approach, you just take a bland, boring approach. I know you feel that way. That's it. Or yes, you've, you've already told me that you're frustrated. I'm aware of that. Gray rock. And, and so sometimes you just have to do that knowing that they're still in, back in that old playbook. They haven't learned the more mature way of doing things. Okay. Um, okay. And, and another question, and this goes into the, uh, the, the basics of narcissism. This person says, um, uh, Dr. C, at what point does this facade that they constantly portray, the false self, actually catch up with them? They seem to handle it by constantly getting some sort of supply. It's like they're never short of supply. At what point does their absence of inner peace catch up to them? That's a great question. Um, so they, they maintain this facade and this person accurately says that it seems as though this narcissist tries to maintain this false self and what does it take to get them to see it? Does it ever, ever actually catch up with them? Uh, do you think that maybe their lack of inner peace might eventually cause them to think I, I need to change tactics? And the, the biggest problem, and I say this as a backhanded compliment, the biggest problem with a question like that, like this is you're thinking like a normal person, which is good. You're a normal person. You're thinking like someone that says, I know there's a healthy way to do this. Let's see if we can apply this right here. And when you say, well, Carter, that's a, that's a problem. Well, the answer is it's a problem when you're dealing with somebody who says, that's not for me. I'm not doing that. And so you're, you can sometimes wish to superimpose a certain form of healthiness on someone that says, remember, you called me out on my false self. That's what I am. I'm a false self and I'm not giving that up. It's, and that's part of narcissism. And so you would think that, uh, and by the way, uh, the, these people tend to have a, a long history of broken relationships. And you would think that the history of broken relationships and, and uh, you can just look at that as evidence that says, boy, something is not working well here. And then the, you go even a little bit further and they seem to have a lack of peace. Does that ever catch up with them? They'll say, oh yeah, I have a lack of peace, but you know what they do when they make that declaration. I have a lack of peace. They look straight at you and say, and you're to blame. You're the cause for my lack of peace. You need to change. And it's like, wow, you don't catch on, do you? There are two people in this equation. I'm willing to take my portion of it, but what about your portion? And the narcissist says, yeah, I'll take my portion. Um, my portion is I'm, I'm correct and you're incorrect and you can't reason with them. And so at what point does their absence of inner peace catch up with them? It doesn't. They just go on to the next relationship and eventually the same pattern will emerge there. And you think, well, do, do all narcissists do this? Well, one of the, uh, the ingredients of narcissism is the inability to empathize, the inability, therefore, to receive input from another person's vantage point. Empathy is all about hearing other individuals and their emotions and their perceptions and their interpretations and truly internalizing that in a way that says, you know, we can make something positive happen because of this form of interaction with each other. Narcissists is like, nah, I don't do that. Okay. Okay, this next one, we're going to go ahead and give the gold star today to this next one here. This person says, uh, Dr. C, I'd like to know, how can narcissists be so needy and yet so dismissive at the same time? 
and then uh, goes on to uh, give a nice good comment. Your channel has been such a blessing and a lifesaver. Thank you so much for what you do. Okay, maybe that uh, helped my, with me giving you the gold star. Yeah, I can be bought. Sorry. Um, it's interesting, you know, with this question, they're, they're both needy and dismissive at the same time. And you capture the essence of that tension that's on the inside of the narcissist. Uh, narcissists are deeply insecure. These are individuals who are thinking, well, do I matter to you? Uh, do you see me as somebody that's worthy of being admired? Do you see as, me as somebody who really does need to be the one that's in control and has all the correct answers like I think I do? And they're constant. And this, the supply that they're seeking is that affirmation that says, yes, indeed, I see you as being the old great person that is, uh, is worthy of all of our praise and honor and all the rest. And, and so the narcissist is thinking, oh, this is good. But experience has shown the narcissist, hmm, not everyone is on my team. Not everyone seems to want to bow down and say, oh, great master, oh, great guru, you're, you're the, uh, the cat's meow. No. And so they, they wind up with this. Uh, they start out with this high idealism. Surely people will see that I'm the one that needs to be in charge here. And then they have this pessimism. It's like, well, you don't seem to be catching on. And so what they do is they just pound you as opposed to thinking I need to rearrange me. That's part of the pattern. And it's, it's so frustrating for those of us who are trying to be healthy to say, okay, okay, okay. You get to be what you are. And uh, there's your playbook. You're doing it. I can't stop you. Uh, and so what we do is we say uh, with a great deal of resignation, it's so unfortunate there that there's such a strong contingent in the population that won't get beyond their many dysfunctional behaviors. And you can be over there thinking, well, do I always have to be the one that's trying to be mature or be reasonable or uh, be understanding? And my option is, no, you don't have to. Um, the alternative is you can join them in their pattern, but I, I even though it, it, it may be uncomfortable, I personally decided I, I want to be that intuitive person. I want to be that kind of person that says, okay, even though uh, I may feel differently, I, I want to stay my pattern. I want to stay on my path. I want to keep trying to, uh, to do the things that you do on team healthy. It's hard, isn't it? Uh, they operate with a certain idealism. I want you to give me all that supply Then surely you're going to do that for me. Right. And then they also have a pessimism and then they, uh, they think, ah, eh, this world's full of nothing but a bunch of idiots. And so both of those are on the inside. Neither one of them is, is accurate, but that's how they think. Okay. The next question, why can't they ever just be honest instead of telling mistruths? Let's just be honest. Well, that's a great question. Now, keep in mind that one of the things that we've already mentioned here, uh, this uh, couple of questions ago, this person says they constantly portray the false self. And then you ask the question, why can't they be honest? The answer, if they were being honest, is I've constructed this false self and I've committed myself to false, uh, dishonest um, uh, ways of portraying me. That's what I am. Now, narcissists, A, they don't have anywhere close to the awareness that what I said implies. And B, it's like, well, if I take that false self down and if I'm honest and I say I, I'm just a conglomeration of many ingredients, some plus, some minus, some in the mediocre range in the middle there, they can't stand it. They've got to be special. Keep in mind that part of the definition of narcissism is uh, the need to, to be uh, seen as uh, a, a step above other individuals. They're very enamored with themselves. They want you to adore them in the way that they, you know, immaturely adore themselves. And so uh, can they ever just be honest? No. 
Um, go back to what I said in, uh, in the very uh, beginning. Uh, we're all alike and we're each unique. Uh, we're all alike in the sense that we each have our problems with, whether it's anger or egotism or fear or uh, sometimes laziness or whatever the, the adjective is. And uh, those of us who are healthy, who are growing, will say, well, yeah, I, I, I can see that within myself. Let's do something about it. Going way back to when narcissists were little kids, it's like, I'm not admitting that. Are you kidding? That's going to get me in trouble. And so they, they start very early in life putting that shield up. And unlike healthy people, they never bring it down. In fact, if anything, uh, the older they get, the, the more committed they are to the shield. And it's confounding because it uh, defies logic. But narcissists are not guided by logic. Uh, logic. Narcissists are guided by self-absorption. So it's, a, it's so important to keep that in mind. All the while, though, saying, but you're the problem. Okay? Uh, all right, this next one. I wonder how many of you have been in this boat before. This person says, I've been married and divorced twice. My first husband was cold, calculated, and just plain mean. He had to control everything. I was attracted to my second husband because he was friendly, outgoing, and seemingly encouraging. But it didn't take long to realize he was selfish and controlling too. Can narcissists have the, and this is the, the, the huge question for us, can narcissists have the same core traits, but just display it differently? And uh, right there, ding, 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 ding. Um, and, and by the way, this second one that you're talking about, they started out being really friendly, unlike that first one. Um, you're describing the classic covert narcissist. Some narcissists are just so loud and out there, and it doesn't take a whole lot for you to see. Ooh, this person is not at all tuned into other individuals. It's all about themselves, and they don't leave a whole lot of room for your imagination. They just put it out there. Other individuals, and I'm, I don't have a statistic on this, but I'm convinced that the majority of narcissism uh, at least starts out on the covert side. Uh, other individuals, it's like, okay, what I'll do is I, I have all these narcissistic ingredients, but I'm going to keep my cover up real good. And so uh, if you need encouragement so that uh, you'll kind of buy into me, yeah, I can be encouraging. If you need understanding, sure, I can show that to you for a while. If you need friendliness, oh, yeah, I got plenty of that to pass around. And yet, over time, it begins to dawn on you. This was part of that transactional thing that I mentioned a few minutes ago. They're not developing relationships. They're developing transactions. They're looking to you to give them their supply. And so whatever they have to do, however, how they have to morph themselves so that they can get on your good side. It's like, yeah, for a while I can do it. And with covert narcissists, one of the biggest frustrations is that, uh, that you can have the frustration of not really knowing what you're dealing with until you're pretty deep into it. Like this person, well, I, I made the decision to marry. And then I began uh, finding out, which says uh, whether it's marriage or friendships or uh, business or whatever your connection is, we really need to go slow with our commitments and even with people inside the extended family. Uh, if, uh, if we're going to engage well with other individuals, we need to be wise to know what the red flags are or what the limitations are and, and accept it for what it is. Um, because every one of us has an inclination towards the, uh, the unhealthy things, but it only takes time. Uh, but it requires time for us to see if it's going to be something that a person is going to take responsibility for and then add the healthy alternatives or if they're not. And that's what covert narcissism is all about. They're in the not category. OK. Um, another question here. I would like to know the deep down root as to why the narcissist is so angry. They seem to hate everything. Uh, many of you know that I began my career early uh, in my late 20s and early 30s um, teaching uh, anger management classes, and then I continued to do that for decades. And one of the things that I concluded is that anger can be a secondary emotion to other emotions or other issues. And uh, in other words, when you experience anger, there's something prior to it that's triggering you, that's causing you to use your anger in a wrong kind of way. 
Uh, now, anger, it can be a legitimate emotion. If somebody is insulting toward you or if somebody is, is deliberately confounding or uh, doing things to mess up your plans or things like that, and for you to have that agitation and irritability, we're not going to say, well, you're wrong to feel that way. Well, you feel that way because you have a legitimate reason to feel that way. Now, in healthy relationships and in a healthy emotional management style, you break it down and you ask, in this moment, what options do I have? And uh, there are healthy ways to deal with your, your anger. You can sit down and you can talk to that person and you can say, uh, there's some things that are bothering me. Here's what it is. You spell it out. You do some negotiating. It may be that if the person is not going to be negotiating, you say, here are my boundaries. These are my consequences. These are my stipulations. And you stand firm. I mean, that's all assertiveness. And then you also, uh, in your anger, you can decide, you know, I, I'm going to express myself. I'm going to let myself feel what I do. But I also have other priorities that I'm going to give myself to. I call them your higher priorities, whether it's patience or uh, dignity and respect and those kind of things. Um, narcissists, when they are angry, they already have a whole host of other issues that they've not come to terms with. Uh, for example, their egotism, their fears and their defenses, their need to be superior, their, uh, their sense of separation and isolation that they have experienced with others that they keep blaming on everybody else. I mean, they have these emotional issues and in their moment of anger, these unresolved matters uh, are at play. And so instead of them saying, uh, hey, let's talk about this constructively, their egotism comes into play. Their defensiveness comes into play. They become very combative. Uh, their emptiness scares them. And so uh, the, the anger of the narcissist is nowhere near the anger of the healthy person because it's being fueled by all of these other unresolved issues. But again, I'm going to come back and say, but instead of intuitively searching out within themselves what that's about, they just simply say, and it's your fault. And so it's so important for you to know, I am not going to take responsibility for the, uh, for the narcissist. I am going to do what I can when I see those kind of behaviors uh, so that I am uh, portraying the better alternatives. I do have that responsibility. I'm responsible for me, but you, Mr. and Mrs. Narcissist, you're responsible for you. And they haven't gotten to that point. Okay. Uh, let, let's do... <laughs> Let's do one, and then I've got this funny um, comment at the end of it. Uh, this one person says, I wonder what this kind of reaction was. This person uh, just puts this little, uh, um, I said, gosh, I'm feeling so tired today. And the narcissistic person says, do you think I'm not tired? <laughs> What's that all about? And that's just a real small snippet of life with a narcissist. You're saying, I'm really tired. Okay, I'm, I'm really tired. And how many of us have said that at some point or another? Multiple times a week, I'm sure. And then this person, the narcissist, said, well, you think I'm not tired? Right there, it's zero empathy for you. It's their chronic need to be superior. It's their attitude of entitlement. Uh, you know, like, I deserve things. You don't, but I do. All wrapped up in that one little exchange there. And it's like, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the lack of insight, the lack of awareness down to the smallest of details. Okay. We're going to end on this one. <laughs> this, this one uh, person says, um, apparently speaking to that narcissist, if your way of living is so superior to mine, then why are you in a federal penitentiary? Hmm, kind of hard to answer that question now, isn't it? And of course, you know what they're going to say. Nah, I got screwed over. Uh, it wasn't my fault. It was somebody else. If your way of living is so superior, why are you in the federal penitentiary? Or, you know, why are you so miserable with all these people? And the answer is because I don't think. So we go back to that opening question. Do narcissists just read from the same playbook? And the answer is, well, we all have those same uh, drives on the inside of us, but narcissists just simply don't take the effort that we're taking right here in this live feed. And when you're watching other videos and when you're hopefully discussing it with trusted people in your life, narcissists don't think that don't take the initiative to say, you know, I've, I've got some serious soul searching to do. It's just not in them. 
but I'm hoping it's in you. I'm hoping it's in me. And I'm hoping that ever, ever how long you have allotted to you on this planet that you're going to be thinking, yeah, and I want to continue to have ongoing insight and awareness. I never want to stop learning. And in doing so, we're going to say, you know, life over here on Team Health is a whole lot better. And let's let's remain devoted to that. Uh, now, for those of you who are new, uh, just go ahead and put your comments or your questions underneath the video here. I pick up on the questions and I can do the copy and paste. And then next week, we're going to pick up and, and go through more. I, I, I really, really like you asking the questions here because, A, it allows me to know you. And by the way, I do get video suggestions or um, uh, ideas from you all and by, through your comments. So thank you. And then, B, it allows us to, uh, to come together as a team and encourage each other and to uh, uh, to hopefully uh, we can be a, a team decision. You know, somebody around here needs to be the healthy one. I, I'm willing to be that person. So go with peace. Be a person of love. We're in a time here in America where we're really sifting out all of this, uh, the, the problems that we have with, uh, with criminality and anger and all of that. Uh, I'm hoping you can be a person of love and that says, I want to stand for decency. My heart goes with those who also want to be decent. And, uh, and, and let's see if we can make a difference in our, each one of us in our little small spheres of influence. Okay. All right, Team Healthy, I shall see you next time. And once again, thanks for your participation here. I, I really do appreciate it.